I'll have the chat box open as I'm going through, so feel free to answer any questions that you might have. All right. So today we'll be going through a data set deep dive for the Power Hour. Uh, and we've basically pulled some examples dealing with both forestry and water quality monitoring that we kind of can walk through in more depth. Um, and as I go along, I'll also more generally describe some applications we've seen for those for both forestry and, and water quality. So the examples we'll be going through today, first we'll start off with disease monitoring and stand counting for forestry, and then we'll close it out with a dual camera data set from water quality monitoring. So for disease monitoring, this is an application we've seen specifically interested, interesting for forestry. Um, that's definitely an area where the multispectral makes sense over an RGB when you're trying to do early disease detection um, before there are um, visual signs of stress on the tree uh, and to identify um, early, sim early symptomatic trees with different vegetation indices or composites um, to get to those things when action can still be taken. So we've had a couple examples of those so far, um, different diseases and pest spreading. The most recent one that we uh, have seen is for bark beetle, uh, and that's through our partner Del Air in France. So I'll use that for the example data set to share with you today. So here we have, this is a spruce forest that was flown, flown by Del Air in their UX11 AG, which is their fixed wing platform. And they use the red edge as their multispectral payload. And so they flew this area about 74 acres uh, and it was a spruce forest stand where they knew there was a bark beetle infestation. And you can see from the RGB um, that there's a little area uh, in the lower left-hand corner where there's visibly dead trees. They're showing up as yellowish in the RGB, but beyond that, it looks pretty uniformly green. And so typically in a stand where there's a bark beetle infestation, they would clear cut the entire stand just because of how fast that pest can spread um, and how destructive it can be. But in this case, they wanted a trial using the drone mapping to do localized cutting. So only the areas that were infected to see if they can salvage the remaining stand, um, let it grow further and harvest it later on. So the first step in their analysis, they ran a crown detection um, classification. So as you can see here, that's what their, this is the Del Air software that they're using um, to do that and identifying each tree by delineating the crown. So that was the first step. And then they worked on the vegetation indice or a way to classify the stressed, very stressed, dead and healthy trees. So that was the kind of the um, segments that they identified. And they used a proprietary index here. It's a, uh, something that they developed with their client. Um, but utilizing MCARI and NDRE indexes that are um, correlated with chlorophyll content in the trees. And so uh, utilizing definitely the, the red edge band for and the near infrared bands for that. And here we can see that the, the most stressed areas are appearing as red and then the most healthy trees are appearing as green. Um, so they used this, they ran a, a classification based on the stressed healthy, very stressed, dead classifications that we mentioned. Um, and they use that to guide their clear cutting or the uh, localized cutting. So based on that map, they drew these polygons to signal um, where they needed to send in crews to do the cutting. In the end, this ended up, they were able to calculate, you know, based on those polygons, how much area that was. And it was only about 35% of the total stand that they needed to cut. So, uh, quite a bit of uh, timber salvage compared to what they would normally do with the clear cutting. Uh, and so now the remaining areas that are healthy and not infested are going to be able to keep growing and drive revenue later on when they're harvested. Um, so this is something they'll also continually monitor, of course, to 
um, make sure that there's not additional spread. The next example is for stand counting. So for, for this one, this is an area we flew near us um, in the Pacific Northwest. And it was a smaller data set that we flew with an Ultim and we flew it on the DJI Matrice 200. And so since it was smaller, we did run our own, um, we ran our own Python code to do the, the stand counting here based on a, a veg vegetation index to identify the trees. Um, I had a GIF here, but I'm realizing now that it won't play that in the presentation. Um, but basically what it would be showing is identifying, highlighting in blue where the trees are. So it's just automated um, workflow where it's identifying in blue where the trees are. And then on the top, the estimated stand count would be generated each time um, a blue uh, image is, is counted. And so this is something that can be done uh, for an easier data set like this on your own for a more complex one. There's softwares like Envy and Pictera that can do it so that you're able to train the model a little bit more so that it doesn't identify um, false positives. So things like um, bushes or other trees, competing vegetation that is not the planted tree variety essentially. And so uh, for stand counting for forestry where we're seeing the benefit of the multispectral is when you're doing stand counting on a more um, rough terrain, something where there is more competing vegetation. So it's not as simple as just identifying between soil pixels and vegetation. There is a variety of vegetation um, and debris and, and whatnot in the area. So that's when the multispectral is especially useful. So you can hone in um, just on those pixels that are the, the tree that is planted. And another example we have for stand counting, this would be more in a nursery setting. Um, so nurseries that are, that are growing trees that they then sell to timber companies for replanting, or in this case, um, just a crop that has a shorter life cycle, eucalyptus. And so this is one where they, a large eucalyptus plantation in Latin America is about 1300 acres. And they flew that with a fixed wing aircraft and the red edge as their payload. And they were able to isolate the vegetation from the soil. Um, and that's what you're seeing here. So basically, if you're looking at a vegetation index, typically the lowest values are soil. Um, so you can use a histogram feature. Softwares like Pix4D have this, have this feature. Um, and then make those values transparent. So the only colorized map that you're seeing is for the vegetation. And that's exactly what they did here. You can see on the right-hand side, the zoomed in version here. Um, of a small, smaller portion of the plantation that we can kind of zoom in and get more detail. Um, but basically how they're able to use these maps was to then guide any replanting that needed to be done. Um, so this is, you know, post-planting X amount of weeks after post-planting. Um, and at that time is when the grower would typically have to make a decision about whether or not to replant any areas. And so this map was um, really useful to them in planning out the logistics of that. So not only where do we need to replant, but how many trees would that end up being? Um, how much labor would be required to do that based on the number of trees and the location of where the replanting needs to happen? And then, of course, um, knowing the geography and, and the conditions in the field themselves, the farm manager can then look at this and see as well if the areas that are showing poor growth. Maybe it's because of a dip in the field and a drainage issue, which is what happened here in this area, drainage issue. Um, so they'd be able to identify that as well, um, just from their knowledge of the field and know not to, that it's probably not worth replanting there. Um, so the map essentially here is just providing that additional layer of insight uh, that the farm manager can then use to um, plan out the replanting. And the last example we have here is for water quality monitoring. Uh, this one was some man-made lakes that was flown in Germany. This is by our uh, partner, Quantum Systems. So they flew a pretty large data set of the surrounding agricultural fields with their Trinity VTOL, and they used the dual camera as their payload. Um, so we zoomed in on these uh, man-made lakes um, 
that were part of the farm because they provide some pretty interesting information here. So first we're looking at the RGB composite. We can see there's some variation between the different lakes, probably based on age. Um, some that appear older looks like the sediment has settled and you can see um, the vegetation at the bottom versus sand. Uh, over here on the left-hand side, you can see it's a lot more cloudy. There seems to be a lot more suspended sediment in that water. But beyond that, um, it's kind of difficult to distinguish between the aquatic vegetation and the trees surrounding versus the green color of the water. Um, so there's not a lot of variation in the greenness essentially between these areas. So if you were trying to run a classification, that would be quite difficult. Where it becomes a lot easier is if you have additional multispectral bands um, to look at. So in this case, we did a false color composite. We did a near infrared, a new red edge band from dual cam and a new green band. And then here you can see a lot more clearly differentiation between um, algae looks like on the top of the lakes. Um, they appear as green versus the blue of the water. So a lot easier to run a classification than there, especially if it was a larger area to see the algae co cover and monitor algae blooms. Um, you can also see that this composite brings out differences even between the, the, the agricultural fields, the different crops planted, and even some of the different tree varieties. Um, so you can start to see how having these additional bands is helpful for species classification work. I'll close out by zooming in here a little bit. So we can see the RGB composite on the left-hand side and that false color composite on the right-hand side. Um, so you can see a lot more clearly the differentiation in the false color composite of the algae versus the water um, versus the surrounding trees and, and vegetation. So this would also apply for other kind of aquatic vegetation. We've had customers looking at invasive aquatic leaves, leaf, uh, weeds that kind of look like water lilies, things like that, that are laying on top of the water and can be difficult to distinguish from the water if the water is, is a greenish color itself or a muddy color. Um, and so that's that's kind of one of the applications that we're, uh, we're seeing especially useful for dual cam. In addition to that vegetation on top of the water, you can also use the bands to look at chlorophyll A concentration in the water and suspended sediment levels um, so that Suspended sediment can be especially something interesting looking at coastal waters um, and wanted to monitor that that suspended sediment does not get too high um, as that can affect the uh, health of the ecosystem there. So that's a, the deep dive we've got for a couple different data sets for you. Um, I've got a question here. What kind of software can you use for interpretation of, of the data? Um, we leave that open to third party options. So we do have on our website, um, we've got a partners page that you can kind of peruse through all of our different uh, software partners. Uh, a lot of times what we see for the processing, um, the two kind of popular options are Agisoft, Metashape, and Pix4D. Um, Pix4D fields is especially useful for if you're looking at right edge and Ultima imagery, they um, offer a pretty streamlined work, uh, workflow for you. Metashape, you can get kind of dive in and get more detailed with how you want the processing workflow to be. And um, it's a lot more technical for those that um, really want to kind of dive in deep. Uh, and then there's beyond those kind of processing softwares that take the raw imagery and, and provide you an orthomosaic map as an output. Then you can take that output uh, and run it either yourself, run analytics in something like QGIS and create these different um, composites like I'm showing here, you can create vegetation indices. Um, if you want to do more than that, you can take it into a software like Envy or Pictera and do some kind of either uh, species classification work or um, run some models to do things like stand counting, like I mentioned. So there's a couple of different options um, and I'll, I'll provide a link to our, our software partners page in the chat here. All right. Well, th thanks everybody for joining us and um, we'll be available the rest of the day today and tomorrow to answer um, questions via the chat here, or you can um, schedule meetings with us directly and we can have a video chat as well.